and we're so tired of the voices in our heads and the voices in our culture. We long to hear the voice of God. Generations come and generations go, but the word of the Lord stands forever. We've been doing a series here on how to read the Bible well, how to read it so that we can hear the voice of God in Scripture. I want to go back to a question I asked at the beginning of the service. Why did Jesus rise from the dead? I know that the Bible has several answers to this question, and it's not wrong to focus on what's in it for us. The Bible talks about that. We read a passage that says we've been born anew to a living hope by the resurrection of the dead. But what makes it a living hope is not the fact that you're living. What makes it a living hope is the fact that he is living. And that's why a deeper, richer, fuller answer to why Jesus rose from the dead refers to what God gets out of the deal based on what God wants in the end. But that can only be understood if we ask an earlier question. Just who is God? How do you see him? I used to have a a tradition in some of my classes where I would ask my students, my freshman students, turn out the lights, close your eyes, and I want you to picture God. I want you to picture God. Wherever you've got him, maybe he's seated on his throne, maybe he's, he's, he's uh, right next to you on your seat, wherever he is. My question to you is this, is he smiling? It's incredible how many people's view of God is rooted in the stern passages of Scripture. The reason why that's incredible and a bit uncomfortable is because when God wanted to let people know who he is, like when he showed up on the top of the mountain there in Exodus, what the people saw were the billows of smoke. And what they pictured was the God who's stern. And what God wanted them to see. We know what God wanted them to see. Because the fullness of God dwelled in Jesus Christ And John says, John says, when I think about Jesus, I think about truth, and I think about grace. The eyes of Jesus reveal the heart of God. What you think about God determines everything you think about yourself and what you think about the world. And so, you may think of God as a divine butler That is, he's a God who's simply there to give us what we ask for. Or perhaps you think of God as a cosmic therapist whose job is to kind of fix small issues in your life as they come up. But there's something deeper and richer than that. Both of those views can lead to a view of worshiping a God you must worship. But it's hard for either of those to turn into a God that you love. Can I ask you another question? Do you love God? I believe God wrote the Bible. I believe God wrote that book. But apologies to all the librarians in the room. It's impossible to love a book. Love is a relationship. I believe that God came in the person of Jesus Christ and that story is true. But we're using the word love incorrectly to say I love an old story. Love is a relationship. In fact, love involves giving and receiving. When you read the Bible, you'll see that God so loved the world, not because he had a fuzzy, warm feeling in his heart, but God so loved the world that he gave his son. Love is a giving and receiving relationship. Do you love God? There was a gathering of college students, and the teacher went around the room and said, I want to know something. Tell me what you think God is thinking. 
Tell me what God is feeling. Tell me God's view of you. Even as you are imperfect and struggle with sin. And going around the room, the students said God is supremely disappointed because of my sin. Now, most of these kids grew up in Christian homes. Some of them were missionaries' kids. It's a Christian university. What are we teaching our children that their view of God is that God either expects us and knows that we're going to live a perfect life, which doesn't make sense, or knowing we're going to live an imperfect life, always walks around with those deep furred eyebrows, disappointed that we didn't live up to something he knows we never will. That's not the God that I see in Jesus Christ. Because 1 John says, I write these things to you so that you won't sin, but listen. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And in chapter 1 he says, if we go around saying we have no sin, we're liars. The God I serve knows that. He knows that. Psalm says God knows that we're dust. He knows that we're dust. And if you don't think God loves you, even when you are failing, I don't think you know my God. Most religions, most religious traditions teach us to think of God as some trinket or an object over there, wholly separate, so separate we can't really think much about him or get to know him. We simply either see him in awe and reverence for who he is, or we're scared to death of him, or we use him for our advantage. But Christianity teaches a relationship with a God who knows you better than you know yourself. Sky Jathani a few years ago wrote a book called With reimagining the way you relate to God. And in that book, he lays out five approaches to how we view life relating to God. And the first one is life from God. This is the consumerist version of Christianity. Why I go to Christianity is because of what I get out of it. This is where you get the language of health and wealth this is where you see all the promises in Scripture and you say, I'm a Christian because I want the robe and the mansion and the crown, the whole bit. I want success in my business. I want miracles when I'm sick. I want power to manipulate and control my surroundings. There are promises in Scripture. There are promises for Christians. But this view says that Christian life is defined by those promises rather than the God who made those promises. The second is life over God. This is the control freaks version of Christianity. We become Christians so that we can control our destiny. We remain Christians because we like having simple categories and we expect God to work according to our formulas. If we punch in the right formula, if we follow the right equation, God, like a vending machine, will give us what we ask for or what we've earned. And following God's principles will guarantee a good life. God's not mysterious. He's entirely predictable. And we use the predictability to judge ourselves and others. There are some basics in Christianity. There are some promises to be sure. There are some, some wisdom to be followed. And if followed, it will lead to a better life. But this approach is defined by what we can know and figure out rather than the God who is past all knowing. The third is life under God. Now, this sounds appealing at first, but this approach is entirely about a ruler-ruled relationship. The focus is on learning God's commands or duties and then keeping them faithfully. And if we do that, then God will be on our side. And there can be a real lack of interest in any real relationship with a person and more interest in keeping rules. Christianity is a religion, a religion of duties, more than a relationship with a person. Now, I want to tell you, the Bible definitely gives rules and duties, and a covenant involves obedience. But this approach is defined by the duties rather than defined by the relationship, which is what we must lean on when we fail in our duties. 
The fourth is life for God. Now, this is the workaholic's vision of Christianity. Life for God is everything about the mission. We use Christianity to give us meaning and purpose and direction in the world. The focus is on our full-time Christian service. We use the language of doing and managing and accomplishing. We want to be busy in the kingdom. We want to be workers for the Lord. And we constantly list the things we've done, and then we list the things we've failed to do. This approach can be exhausting, and we appear to others as exhausted. It leads to burnout. It leads to unhealthy relationships in other areas of our life. It has a hard time understanding rest or the peace we have with God. It's defined by what we're doing for God rather than resting in His grace and recognizing what God is doing both for us and what God is doing in spite of us. And then the last one. The last one is life with God. This is where life is about a relational growth with a master, a father. In our normal walks of life, a father will first carry us in his arms, and then hold us by the hand, and then gently pat us as he helps us learn to walk, and then be by our side as we begin to walk, and then be ready at a moment's notice when we need him. This is the order of growth of what life with a father is like. We always root Christianity in, and we define Christianity by a relationship with a living, loving Lord. This is seeing the Christian life as life with God, and it can revolutionize the way we read the Scriptures and the way we see Christianity. Why do I want to focus on this last one this morning? I think it's because in all the other options, God is used as a means to an end whether it's blessings or control or meaning or purpose or direction, God is being used to achieve something other than our heart's most important desire. And it's our fault as preachers. We gave the vision for years of a life for God and not enough of a vision of a life with God. I think we try to convince people to change their circumstances. Stop doing what you want to do. Start doing what I think God wants you to do. If you can change your circumstances, then maybe you'll be in a better position, and then we can start listing all the things you need to do, have done, or will do for God. The problem with this language is it leads to us exemplifying and extolling those who are extremely busy, as if extremely busy is more valuable in the eyes of God. Oh, I think the world of the people who are busy in the kingdom of God 24-7, I do. I admire them. Do we value the single mother who's raising three children on her own? She hasn't knocked on a door in years and doesn't have time to do that to save her life. If we do extol her, we'll extol her for getting her kids ready for church on Sunday morning or for taking the time to do the devotionals every night, both of which are great. But do we see value in the person who we can just tell knows their Savior and rests in the peace of Christ? Do we see value in a person whose life is not defined by what they're going to get or what they're going to give, but by who God is? Think about when you gather with your family. It may be at Thanksgiving. It may be at Christmas. It may be right now. And there may be some members of the family that you have a hard time being with. And if you have a hard time being with them, the next move is to try to do something for them. So like Martha, you're busy in the kitchen and you're getting everything ready and you are wearing yourself out doing good. But it keeps you from having any real conversation. 
And all the four, all the four is good. But when the gathering ends and you shake hands, what you hear is, well, I wish we had a chance to talk. I, I barely saw you. Think about all the poor people in the world that you want to help. So you get busy in service to the poor. And you're raising money. And you're traveling the world. And you're sending the money left and right. And you're buying the food. And you're mailing the food left and right. That's a good thing. It's possible that at the end of all of that, the poor are still strangers to you. We can live our lives in such a way that the soundtrack of our life is Brian Adams. Everything I do, I do it. If you ever wonder why the elders never asked me to lead singing, now you know the answer. I heard an amen. All, all gestures that are generous and kind don't get to the heart of the problem. You can give gifts and there's still a rift between you. You can wear yourself out and never have the talk that you need. You can do all the charity and never know a poor person. Four isn't even the way God relates to us primarily. God doesn't just set the world straight and then give us good stuff. In the Gospel of Matthew, God says, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you in the person of Jesus, so I want to give a name that will tell you what I'm all about. And you're going to call his name Emmanuel, which is more than God is for us. That means God is with us. John says that the Word became flesh and lived among us. You can do four without any relationship that shapes how you see the other. You can do four without ever working through the really difficult things that need to be worked through to have a real relationship. You can do four and realize it's easier on me because it requires of me, but in the deepest ways, it doesn't require me at all. Remember the prodigal son? He comes home after all of his time of riotous living, and the dad throws a feast for him, and the older brother can't stand it. And the older brother lists his reasons for complaint, and they have to do with how little he's received compared to what this feast is all about. After all, says the older brother, look at all the things I've done for you. And the father responds in a way we often forget. He says, son, you've always been with me. The good stuff, the good stuff is the relationship of with. And this, my son, has been absent. He's been dead. You've been with. That's what we're trying to reestablish here. It's not a code where I'm giving you based upon what you've done for. I'm trying to build the bridge so we can be with. If we want to experience life with God, not merely as a, a means so that we can achieve something else, when you see God as our treasure. In John chapter 1, beginning in verse 39, 38, Jesus turns and sees them following, and the very first words out of his mouth in the Gospel of John are this, what is it that you really want? What is it that you are seeking? And they say, we, we want to know where you're staying. And he says, come and see. And they stayed with him. The followers take note of the teacher, and they use the same language. 
Philip finds Nathanael and says, We found him of Moses, of whom Moses says in the law, and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathanael says, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip just quotes the words that Jesus quoted to him. Come and see. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus is teaching people. His own actual literal family are standing outside. And they're calling for him to come out. Meanwhile, there's a group of devoted followers who are seated inside all around him. These are the ones who are with him. And Jesus looks at those who are seated all around him, those who sat at his feet, those who are with him, and says, these are my mother and my brothers. This is family, those with me. In Acts 4 and verse 13, the apostolic pair are doing amazing things. They're living in such a way that they're basically saying, okay, listen, let us go. We're going to preach about Jesus. Put us in jail. We're going to write about Jesus. Kill us. We're going to be with Jesus. You can't keep us down. And they're amazed by them. And suddenly it dawns on them why they're amazed. These guys, they've been with Jesus. Look at what being with Jesus has done for them. Do you know why so many have a hard time finding freedom and wonder in the Christian life? I think it's because we teach them to desire something other than God. Or maybe it just has never been explained what it would be like to be changed from the inside out as a result of being with a living Lord. We've been born again unto a living hope by the resurrection of the dead. Is it true? Is it true that a life with God is possible? Throughout Scripture, God says, this is what I want. It was to Isaac at Beersheba when God shows up and he says, don't be afraid, I am with you. It was at Bethel that God said to Jacob, don't you know I am with you? When Joshua and his people cross the Jordan, God says to Joshua and tells Joshua, tell the people, your father, your God is with you. To David as he's making plans, God says, don't be afraid, I am with you. Through Isaiah to the people of Israel, to Jeremiah, through Jeremiah to the people, through Zephaniah, my God is with you. He delights in you. He rejoices over you with singing. My God is in the midst of you. To the returning exiles through Haggai, to Paul in the book of Acts, God says, don't you know what I want is to be with you. You can't miss this fact. God with us and we being with him are central themes of Scripture. With is at the heart of the Christian faith. The Word was with God before anything else. Before anything else, there was a with. This means that with is the most fundamental thing about God. In Eden, we walked with God. The last words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel is, I am with you always. And the end of the story, in Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven and the voices say, now the dwelling of God is with man. And they will be with him forever. The most important word in the Bible describing the heart of God and the nature of his purpose and the nature of our future is with. That's why God made people. That's why God entered into a covenant. That's why he came to be among us. And that's why we're going to have a future to be with. And wouldn't you know it? With is all inclusive. 
all the other things we talk about, the things we strive for, are included in the package. Life with God includes blessings from God. Life with God includes assurances. Life with God includes service for Him. Life includes living under His reign. But it's all rooted in a real relationship with a living Lord. So what if Bible reading and Bible study were an opportunity to explore an inner change, an inner transformation that allows us to break free from fear, from our old ways of thinking, from our selfish desire? What if Bible reading was an opportunity to become different people, ready to experience the abundant life God gives because we're not just reading a dead letter, we're reading a living message from a living Lord? What if, what if we were to read as if reading could transport us into the throne room itself so that we could experience with rather than just looking for lines that tell us what to do for? I think there's a way to do that. I think if we read prayerfully, we can do that. That means recognizing that I want this relationship. I don't just want the treasures that flow from God. God is my treasure. And so my prayer is that I will be transformed to see God for who He is as I read. We need to read expectantly. In Christ we are reconciled to God. Life isn't just about how do I get into heaven, but how do I let God's heaven, God's reality, fill every time and every space. Read actively. Read so that we're mingling spirits. God says when we take communion, we're mingling spirits. God says when we're sharing our life with others, we're mingling spirits. And wouldn't it be the case that God's spirit communes with our spirit and vice versa as we engage in a real conversation with God? Can Bible reading be that? You bet it can. At the time of the Reformation, there was a man who was doing all kinds of things for God. But it wasn't until he opened his Bible to the book of Romans and began to read that he said, I've been wrong about all of this. He wrote a book about Romans, about the change that took place within his life because of his reading of Romans. And 200 years later, 286 years ago from now, another man was sitting in a meeting and listening to someone read from that book, reading the preface to the epistle of Romans. Earlier that day, he had been reading 1 Peter, but nothing was happening. He had shared Jesus in a jail cell and converted someone, but nothing was happening in his heart. But as he listened to someone talk about what Romans did for them, he writes in his diary, my heart was strangely warmed. Can Bible reading do that for you? In 1502, Ludolf of Saxony said, here's what it should be like when you're reading your Bible. Go with the wise men to Bethlehem and adore the little king. Help his parents carry the child and present him in the temple. Along with the apostles, accompany the good shepherd as he performs his miracles. With his blessed mother and St. John, be there at his death to have compassion on him and to grieve with him. Touch his body with a kind of devout curiosity, handling one by one the wounds of your Savior who's died for you. With Mary Magdalene, seek the risen Christ until you're found worthy to find Him. Look with wonder at His ascent into heaven as though you were standing among His disciples on the Mount of Olives. Enter into the story. In our own movement, this has been an important element. Alexander Campbell in 1839 wrote a little article called Bible Reading. And he says, you know, there's a lot of different ways to read the Bible. What would happen if you read the Bible devotionally? He says, this is what God designs and desires in giving us the Bible to read. He would that we catch the Spirit rather than learn the doctrine of this holy book. 
there's a critical reading of the Bible, a polemic reading, a sectarian reading, a penance reading, which however frequent and sincere, reach not within the circle of grace and spiritual enjoyment, but a devotional and sanctifying reading of that sacred book is essentially different from the readings of the theologian or the moralist, or the sectary, or the virtuoso of every caste and school. The man of God reads the book of God to commune with God, to feel his power and his divinity stirring within him, to have his soul fired, quickened, animated by the spirit of grace and truth. He reads the Bible to enjoy the God of the Bible. That the majesty, purity, excellency, and glory of its author may overshadow him, inspire him, transform him, and new create him in the image of God. The words of Jesus to such a one are spirit and life. They are light and joy. They are truth and peace. Such a one converses with God. His readings are heavenly musings. God speaks. He listens. Occasionally, And almost unconsciously, at intervals, he forgets that he reads. He speaks to God, and his reading often terminates in a devotional conversation with God. The Bible reading of all enlightened Christians generally terminates in a sacred dialogue between the author and the reader. But then he ends with this. He says, I'm going to use my own language here, there's something interesting, so interesting, I need to emphasize it. The author of the Bible is always present with the book. This is not true of any other book in the world. Most authors are dead, but this author forever lives and is forever present. You and I have been born anew to a living hope by the resurrection of the dead because he lives forever because he wants to be with us and scripture is a way for us to get that message as our hearts burn with fire as God opens the scriptures to us and explains the scriptures to us and we devote ourselves and commune with God this morning. This is true for every believer, but if you are not in Christ, this communion can begin anew today. We will take you as you are, but God never leaves you that way. We will take your confession that Jesus is Lord, and on the basis of that confession, we will take you and allow you to join with every other believer throughout history who has said yes to Jesus and has been united with his blood in baptism. You're going to rise to walk a new life filled with the Spirit of God, and your communion won't just be with each other. It'll be with a living, loving Lord, and you can be with him forever. Won't you come while we stand and sing an invitation song? Thank you for joining us. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been enriched. And if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments, reach out to us at prayers at wschurch.net. God bless you. Tune in next week.